Okay, so this is going to be a video lecture on total war, which is a concept that we introduced last class in relation to trench warfare. Uh, in total war, entire economies, entire labor forces are all focused on the war effort. So it wasn't just British soldiers who fought in World War I, it was also British civilians who fought in World War I. Uh, the fighting isn't necessarily picking up a gun, although sometimes even kids had to fight as soldiers became more and more depleted. But this really means people fighting by producing materials in factories, or by working as nurses, or by uh, working for railroad companies that would transport supplies. So in total war, economies and labor forces are focused on the war effort. The flip side of this is that it means all civilians are basically targets. Uh, if you are working to produce for the war effort, you're not really any different than a soldier. You might not pick up a gun, but you're producing the guns. So that meant civilian deaths. For instance, here you have Serbian civilians who are being hung because they were aiding in the resistance movement to Austria-Hungary, or you have civilians who are being captured. So a total war means countries' entire economies are devoted to the war. It also means, however, that civilians very often end up suffering. Uh, now, in a total war, you have all kinds of people fighting, and even in World War I, you would have female soldiers. So these are uh, Russian soldiers who had actually um, served with distinction, is what they called it. So they had actually um, you know, suffered casualties and had fought really hard in battle. Um, but for the most part, women didn't serve as soldiers. What they did is they, they worked at what was called the home front. So you guys learned about western fronts and eastern fronts, which was basically like a line of trenches that marked the end of German forces or the end of French forces. It's where most of the fighting took place. But there's also something called the home front. So this is where the factories are being used uh, to produce weapons or are being, uh, you, you know, food is being processed to be shipped off to uh, soldiers. So most of the time women or older people or even kids worked in factories or at home on what was called the home front. So in a total war, there's not just a fighting front, there's a home front. Uh, women in Germany, Britain, France, etc., you know, they worked in factories to produce for the war effort. Uh, you also, as a result of this, because it takes so much money to fight a war, you had some countries that were actually like profiting from this. So the British economy actually did better because they were giving out loans to countries like France and Russia to produce their factories. Remember, Britain was uh, quite a bit ahead in terms of industrialization over most of the rest of the world. Uh, the United States also did really well financially because of this. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the United States uh, exploited these countries, but at the same time, the U.S. was making a lot of money from this war. Plus, there was no fighting taking place in the United States. Uh, now, Germany and Austria and Hungary and Ottoman Empire, all the central powers, they're not allied with Britain, and so they weren't making, you know, they weren't getting loans from Britain. The United States is a little bit different story, and we'll get to that soon. But you also have to encourage your civilians to work, and that's where propaganda comes into play. Uh, now, here are a couple examples of propaganda. You've probably heard this term before, but what it really is is it's, it's like advertisements for the government, it's produced by the government, to encourage citizens to do something. So here you've got propaganda encouraging women to uh, basically drive for the war effort, so be drivers in supply lines. Here you have propaganda encouraging people to turn their silver into weapons, basically. So you would return extra silver. Here you have people being encouraged to save their food so that soldiers have more to eat. Now, what ends up happening is that <clears throat> there's a stalemate. So on the Western Front, on the you know, on most of the fronts, soldiers have dug in and are in trenches, and no one is really winning. 
you also have countries that are completely mobilized for total war. So all of those factories built during the Industrial Revolution are now just churning out weapons and machines used to fight the war. This means that supply lines are really, really important. So that means getting these materials back in front to the war are, are really, really important. What all of this adds up to is a new strategy for how to win the war. And this is called War of Attrition. And it basically means whichever country gives up because they run out of supplies is going to lose. So because there's stalemate, the, the focus of the war shifts. No longer is it about killing all the enemies. It's about killing enough and making your enemy run out of supplies so that they have to give up. Now, this brings up a global war, basically. So countries like Britain, France, and even Germany have colonies all over the world. And these colonies uh, produce soldiers and laborers who eventually make their way to Europe. So here you actually have Indian soldiers. You had hundreds of thousands of Indian soldiers who fought in Europe. You also have here soldiers from Vietnam, which was known as Indochina, and it was a colony of the French. And you have as many as 100,000 Vietnamese who came to Europe and worked as laborers during World War I. But what colonies really supply these countries with are things like raw materials and uh, you know, basically resources that can lead to more things. So in order for these colonies to get their supplies to Europe, though, you would need to ship them along supply lines. So to get oil, for instance, from the Middle East up to Europe, or excuse me, oil from, you know, the United States to Europe, you would need to ship them across the Atlantic Ocean and then somehow uh, get them to a country. So, for instance, the United States is trading with both sides of the war for a long, long time. Uh, here you actually had a German submarine that made its way all the way to the United States in 1916, so two years after the war started, and it was met by applause from the Americans. Uh, Americans were a multi-ethnic culture, and so you had Germans there who wanted to support Germany. So the, uh, here you have a German U-boat, I'll get to what that is in a sec, landing in the United States for resupplies. So supply lines, being able to, to keep this total war moving is really important, which brings up maybe one of the most decisive uh, strategies of World War I, which is a blockade. Now blockade basically just means cutting off supply lines. So the British enacted a blockade of the North Sea, which you can see here. It's really the only port that Germany has, and their ports are right here where this mouse is moving forward and back. Now, this blockade basically shut off Germany's supply lines. So all of the central powers could no longer trade with the United States. They could no longer get access to any colonies that they might have. And Germany was especially affected by this. This meant a couple things. First of all, the United States, since it couldn't trade with Germany, started trading more and more with Great Britain and France. And eventually, they're going to actually fight with Great Britain and France. They're better customers because they actually trade. This also means that the Germans now, instead of being resupplied, have to take whatever they can from countries that they have already occupied. So Belgium, for instance, was referred to as the Rape of Belgium, possibly not just because of so many civilians being killed, but because the Germans took supplies from Belgium and used it. Regardless, about 600,000 Germans died during the war. These are civilians, not soldiers, just because they didn't have enough to eat as a result of this blockade. So once again, this war of attrition is going to be the key to the war, and because Britain blocks off this North Sea, Germany loses a lot of its supplies. So you might be able to see who is going to start to run out of resources first. Germans try and do things about this. Uh, that brings up U-boats, which are known as Untersee boats. It basically means a boat that goes under the sea. That's what a German submarine was. And Germans tried to use these submarines to actually go underwater to get new supplies, 
and also to hide in the water and fire on British supply ships. The Germans decided that they were going to basically fire on any British supply ships if the British wouldn't let them get supply ships. Eventually, this basically makes a lot of people mad all across the globe. Remember, Germany is also trying to get people to side with it. The goal is not to kill everybody in Europe. The goal is to get the Allied powers to give up. So at various points in the war, the Germans will suspend their U-boat campaigns. But for the most part, these U-boats are going to be uh, patrolling the waters, doing everything that they can to try and get supplies to Germany or to try and stop supplies from getting to Britain. Again, this is total war. So ships carrying civilians were often fired upon. Here is an example that uh, is pretty famous in American history. The Lusitania was a boat in which 128 Americans, civilians, were killed. This was just a cruise liner that the Germans fired upon in order to uh, basically make sure that the British weren't sneaking supplies on cruise ships. The British were doing this, but the Germans happened to fire upon a boat here that wasn't carrying any supplies. So total war has a lot of ramifications. It's got a lot of consequences. And one of the biggest consequences of this is that no civilian is safe during total war. Another consequence of total war, however, is this war of attrition, which means that the country that is going to lose out is going to be the country that loses out its resources. The country that has to give up is going to be the country that can no longer fight. So although a total war will lead to more civilian casualties, it also means that the other side has to keep fighting until they simply cannot fight anymore. That's it.